even though folks have been cross-dressing for entertainment since the dawn of time, the rise of the modern drag queen can be traced back to some relatively recent events and a few key artists. While American society in the 1960s was opening up to the many possibilities offered by the sexual revolution, a lot of drag artists took the art of female impersonation very seriously and didn't stray too far from a feminine ideal. It was folks on the fringe like Divine, Sylvester, the Coquettes, Hollywood Lawn, and David Bowie who shaped drag into a multifaceted art form. Today, queer educator, doctor of drag, Lady J. Martinez O'Neill Davenport joins us to take a look at the rise of the modern drag queen. From Hollywood Lawn and the Warhol superstars to David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust persona to RuPaul, who made history by being the first drag queen to get signed by a major record label. Listen as we talk about Charlie Chaplin as the silver screen's first drag superstar. Charles Ludlam and the Theater of the Ridiculous Plays, where two actors did all the roles. Why Paris is Burning caught fire when the film came out. Madonna's influence on RuPaul. And just how close RuPaul came to becoming just a footnote in history as just another club kid with a big dream. I'm Fausto Fernos. I'm Mark Fillion. And this is Feast of Fun. This holiday season, don't leave Feast of Fun out in the cold. Give the gift of 12 years of amazing podcasts. Become a Plus member at feastoffun.com slash plus. Make a donation at feastoffun.com slash donate. Or check out our store, feastoffun.com slash store. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Hello, darlings. It's Lady J. Hi, is this Doctor of Drag, Lady J. Martinez O'Neill? That's me, the first and only Doctor of Drag. <laughs> Are you uh, related to Ryan O'Neill or Tatum O'Neill? I am not. I am a part of the O'Neills of Tennessee. Ashley O'Neill's one of the first of my many drag mothers. Oh, that's your drag family name. Yeah, so all my names are family names. Um, O'Neill is Ashley O'Neill from Knoxville, amazing trans woman showgirl of the South. Um, Martinez is Erica Martinez from Cleveland, Ohio, who adopted me into her family. And she is 45 time title holder, five time national title holder, pageant queen of the Midwest. Mm. And then the unnamed mother is Miss Hamblin, who was my best friend of like 11 years and who is really the person who started me down the path of all this research, too, and gave me the first stage I ever got on. And that is the little tiny skinny white boy that is Latrice's fiance. Oh, wow. You're actually yeah. biologically related to Latrice Royale. Not but bi- Well, yeah, I guess so. If he's my he's my I call him my mother, father, sister, brother. Oh, he's wow. a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. So, so your full name is uh, on Facebook is Jeremiah Lady J. Martinez O'Neill Davenport. If you're nasty, yeah. just the Lady J. Martinez. Yes. Or Dr. Lady J, if you really want to shorten it up. <laughs> Dr. Lady. Because <laughs> that makes it shorter. What do, you, what, what do you want us to call you? Just Lady, call me Lady J. Okay, Lady J. Okay, Dr. Lady J. I have this rash in between my thighs. <laughs> I want you to take a look at it because it's really embarrassing every time I have sex yeah, with somebody. Yeah. I, I can tell yeah. you to go look somewhere else, but you can go ahead and pay me for the visit. I have, a, I, have a swelling, <laughs> I have a swelling between my legs, and every now and then it gets a little discharge. But I kind of like it. <laughs> it's good. Just give it a little rub every day. And as long as you keep that discharge flow, you know, you'll be good. Now, you have dedicated your academic life to studying drag through the years. And your specialty is the 1970s from Andy Warhol to RuPaul. How did your interest in this drag history come about? It started off before the days of Drag Race. I was just a crazy drag fan since I was a teenager. I became obsessed with all the drag movies, Priscilla, Tu Wong Fu, The Birdcage, even Mrs. Doubtfire for, for, to its own end. And of course, like the, tra- the traditional, I'm a weirdo queen. So of course, I came to drag through Rocky Horror Picture Show. 
And so that happened. Me and my best friends sat around quoting those movies like 24 seven. Then I got into college. And once I decided I didn't want to be a band director, I fell in love with the idea of studying drag and carried it over into grad school, basically realizing as I read more about drag history, academic writing about drag, like Judith Butler, I kept feeling like, you know, all this gender theory is really cool and useful, but it doesn't really describe much about what you experience at a drag show or what a drag queen is conceptualizing when they're producing their numbers. It just didn't really relate to reality in a lived experience kind of way. And I felt like the more I tried to figure out where my place was in the world of academics and as a drag queen, I felt like what am I most suited to do? What am I uniquely suited to do? And that is to be a drag queen sitting at a table of academics, trying to make the case that our art deserves as much study as sculpting or painting or performance art or whatever, and that it has its own separate history that shouldn't be marginalized in the way it has been or not even recorded. And that, in fact, we've been sort of front and center in a lot of different major movements that are the mainstream, as far as punk, rock and roll, new wave, new romantics, disco, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we've been written out because the people writing the stories are usually straight white guys or straight women who go like, ah, this gay stuff is just something else that was happening, or I don't really understand it, so I'm not going to talk about it. But you, you, you have to concede that academics have always been studying Andy Warhol and, and his scene, especially with Hollywood oh, for, long, sure. for quite some for sure. time now. Yeah, and that's part of the issue, too, is that depending on what part of academics you're looking at, different people were exploring things from different sides and not really ever talking to one another. Mm. So, like, people who were talking about drag in the world of the visual arts, who were talking about, you know, film and Andy Warhol's movies, weren't talking to people who were punk and rock music specialists who were writing the history of those fashion and social movements at the same time. So, a lot of those things get kind of represented in one-off kind of sources, but they never really become part of the story. You'd be surprised how many academics I've talked to who feel like they know something about Andy Warhol and have never heard of Hollywood Lawn or Candy Darling or any of those girls. It, it is it is interesting because, uh, like in college, I was really fascinated with Andy Warhol's club scene. You know, the uh, I think there's a there's a really great book by uh, one of the club kids, Ultraviolet. Was mm -hmm. her name? They didn't call themselves club kids. They call themselves superstars. Mm. Yes. <laughs> and then a lot of these uh, kids just did, you know, very much what people do today in clubs. Just do these outrageous pageants and spectacles. And, you know, it was all about pushing boundaries. And much like RuPaul, Andy Warhol was very fascinated with transgender sex workers of, of his day in New York City. Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually kind of like one of the linchpins of a lot of the things I'm talking about is finding ways or ways that it, major figures like Andy Warhol and like RuPaul have appropriated sort of parts of the black trans sex worker image, language, etc., but combined it with some other homogenizing force, and that is what made it sort of go mainstream because it was sort of whitewashed in some element. Does that make sense? Yeah. What do you mean by homogenized with something else? What, what do you mean by that? So like, okay, so when RuPaul takes the language of, um, of black trans sex workers and uses it inside of the song Supermodel, it changes that song, it changes phrases that she heard first from black trans sex workers, as evidenced in what she says in her own books, mm -hmm. um, and repositions them inside of the clean teen sort of supermodel glamour image that isn't about sex but is about glamour which is something different right it's so sort like of work the one way sweetie and stuff that kind of stuff is sachet chante that's all sex yeah, worker sachet, talk. yeah a lot well yeah some of that and um there's a bunch of other stuff in her first albums too that i'm blanking on right now um but Tell yeah the this, man to with the money to come here, come here and, and pay, pay me, me. She's yes. not talking about the club kids or the gigs. She's talking about her John. Mm. Yeah, or like when she uses, uh, I ain't throwing no shade, I just want to get paid. Yeah. Stuff like that is stuff that's more from the sex worker lingo of people that she was hanging around. And that was part of what her image was based on before she turned it into the Glamazon, was this 
Um, and there's like videos of her. There's one video of her where she's interviewing other people who are sex workers in New York for cable access in Manhattan. And then at the end, you know, she goes off in a car with this guy. And in the book, she plays it off in a way that's like, oh, did I, didn't I? But it's very obvious, like, girl, you were sucking dick for some coin, too. <laughs> <laughs> like, like. That's interesting, yeah, because we think about RuPaul sort of uh, being above it all, but in some ways, you know, she is today. But, you know, the young RuPaul that moved to New York City was definitely struggling to make ends meet. And oh, it's very conceivable that any gender nonconforming artist or LGBT person who's living on the margins in any urban environment would consider at least sex work. I mean, I certainly, I certainly did. And, um, Absolutely. you know, it's, it's just a, a way of survival, but it's also a way that we express ourselves in our creativity and our sexuality. Oh yeah. And to be clear, my, my point is never anything about judgment. My point is more, what is done to homogenize these images to or, homogenize is maybe not even the word I'm looking for to make them a little bit safer and more family friendly for television. If that makes, that makes sure. it better. She sold it to the corporations, honey. Mm. So let's travel yeah. back in time a hundred years ago to a comedian and crossdresser named Charlie Chaplin, who made this really fantastic movie. It's a short film called a woman where he sneaks into this young woman. He's dating's house and gets caught by her father trying to seduce his daughter. And in order to save his ass, he dresses up as a pretty young woman, shaves his famous Charlie Chaplin mustache off, and then the father falls in love with Charlie Chaplin in drag. Hilarity ensues. And of course, uh, Charlie Chaplin gets caught and gets kicked out of the house. When you, know, when you think about like all the times in films and in, in popular culture where the humor is about the 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 main character cross dressing and then somebody falls in love. You think of a Elmer Fudd. You think about Tootsie. Uh, Tootsie. You think about yeah, Tootsie. Uh, some like it hot. Mrs. Doubtfire. All that can be traced back to that film. Andy uh, Charlie Chaplin, 1915, a hundred years ago. You know, and in, in a lot of ways, like it, I don't know if drag has changed very much a hundred years later, has it? Well, it's kind of been different. I, I always feel like drag is never one thing. Like, that's one of the things I always try to, to focus on whenever I'm kind of thinking, well, is it this way or is it that way? Is that when it, whatever we're seeing in the line of history is such a thin, razor thin, tiny little slice of what's actually happening because so little gets recorded. But even in the teens and the 20s, you have kind of two really separate different things already happening. One is what you're talking about, which becomes... Um, there's an academic who has a word for it, temporary transvestite movies, movies where people have to be, it's usually a straight guy becomes a drag queen or is put in drag in order to get him out of a tough situation or in order for him to escape from something or to pass as somebody else or whatever. But then you also have like the tradition of balls and pageantry that was already coming up through the early 1900s that becomes these queens that in the 20s and 30s, um, like Julian Eltinge, like Francis Renault, uh, and there's a ton of others, um, who you can go and see their live show. They tour around like the same kind of vaudeville circuit that burlesque girls do. Um, and then you can buy sheet music with their picture on it. And in fact, you want to talk about something not changing. RuPaul, what she has done to market drag, goes all the way back to the 30s with Julian Eltinge, who not only had sheet music with pictures of him in and out of drag on it, but he also sold a drag U style magazine in it. He sold Julian Elton's cold creams, Julian Elton's face powders and Julian Elton's little sections that were basically like, if I can do all this to make me look so beautiful, think what I could do for you ladies. What years are we talking here? He started in the teens when he was a teenager, and then by the 30s, he was one of the world's biggest stars, like a multi, multi, multi millionaire with his own like three story high billboard on Broadway and a theater named after him on Broadway. He was like a superstar, but I will say he also ended up at life in a very destitute place because when those laws came around that you couldn't wear you know, X number of women's articles of clothing, they shut down his final show that he was trying to raise money with uh, in later days. And he had to stand next to his costumes on a rack and just sort of describe what he would have done in each of them. 
Oh my God, that's so sad. Yeah, isn't that so tragic? That is and that so was like in the late forties, I want to say. And there was a because he used to be able to do this, and they passed some laws being like men can't wear women's clothing. Yeah, and so then they would come in, and especially because like you know a lot like anything else, a lot of times a lot of queens could go under the radar, and nobody's looking for what they're doing. But because he was a big star, as soon as the the whole thing was announced, it was whoosh, just shut down immediately. So yeah, it's crazy. Andy Warhol was this uh, graphic designer who sort of became a sensation along with a, a couple of other gay men, Robert Rauschenberg and um, um, other uh, to create what was what's now known as the pop art mu- movement and really sort of um, associate um, gay culture and gay sensibilities with art. So like the, the whole kind of cliche of like going to an art gallery and, you know, it's being this fabulous event and all this stuff. You know, you really can be traced to Andy Warhol in, 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 uh, in his brilliance in turning his exhibitions into happenings, into phenomenons that invited, um, you know, the, the, the creme of the creme of, the, of New York's aristocracy, celebrities, and some really colorful characters. And Andy Warhol was very fascinated by sex workers. And his film, Trash really uh, captured uh, two very famous um, sex workers, Joe D'Alessandro, who was a male hustler, and Holly Woodlawn. And, you know, in many ways, they just sort of played themselves in the film. And and uh, his his film, his approach to making uh, movies was, was just treating people, you know, it was kind of like the beginnings of a reality television show. It, he just basically had them play themselves and act out and ham it up in front of the camera. Yeah, and like I think that is one of the biggest things that we see in a ton of the the work that comes up and what we talk about or what I'm talking about in the dissertation and my work in the 80s um, and in the 70s is work that's inspired by this sort of do it yourself. um, We don't need a budget kind of, especially in film that we see in both Warhol and in uh, John Waters early movies. What's uh, Andy Warhol's relationship to to John Waters around this time period? You know, I honestly don't know that much um, about the two of them connectively as far as the what the tissue between the two of them is. But there, there certainly was like a market for these kind of uh, transgressive uh, queer f- uh, underground films. And certainly John Absolutely. Waters uh, early in his early days with multiple maniacs mm-hmm. and uh, pink flamingos, he would just, you know, put up the, the, the reels, the movies in a trunk of his car and he'd just drive around the country showing them. Yeah. Banned from place to place. Whereas I think Warhol, because he was an established artist, the, his stuff was more uh, had more credibility. So it would be shown in different places. You know, and not have yeah. people being like, you have to shut it down. Of course, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with the work. Well, you know, was it as transgressive as John Waters? I don't think it was. It was just in a totally different mm-hmm. way. I mean, I don't think so, realistically, mm-hmm. especially because you have like the sort of art world to show it to. Mm-hmm. That makes kind of an enormous difference as far as like John Waters wasn't taking this to like an art school and being like, all right, let's analyze this. He was just sort of being like a film terrorist, mm. like you said, going into a theater and being like, all right, here's divine eating dog shit. OK, we got shut down. Next place. <laughs> I don't know. It's like uh, some people phrase it as a reaction to conservative politicians and and time periods. But, you know, certainly like disco and punk share a lot in common and punk uh, music led to sort of uh, glam rock and Roxy and you can kind of see the the correlationship between Twisted Sister in the 1980s and, you know, Dr. Frankenfurter and uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show in the 1970s. Absolutely. And it's no accident that, like, you know, Dee Snyder was probably the most impassioned person who, when uh, Tipper Gore was doing all of that, you know, let's ban every different kind of sale of anything that's transgressive music wise, that when those uh, um, hearings were happening, if you've never seen D. Snyder, what he has to say, I would strongly recommend it to anyone listening because he really ripped everyone in Congress a new giant asshole um, talking about free speech for people making art and making music. And, you know, like you said, it's obvious that he's a he's a thought out person and he's someone whose work is clearly inspired by this kind of transgressive work that's coming from before. 
that there's a reason for this crazy, outlandish, insane, spectacular look to draw attention to a message, uh, you know, that means something in all of those cases. Who was Klaus Nomi and what was his relationship to David Bowie? Okay, so um, part of this gets at what I wanted to say about John Waters and uh, Andy Warhol, which is really what to me is important about the two of them happening around the same time is that both of them show people all over the country that are queer and that are weird that not only can you be a star, but you can do it on your own terms and you can do it without the means of production. You don't have to own a record studio. You don't have to have an entire film studio at hand or have a a record contract or a film contract. You can just go out and make stuff and start building from the ground up. And so that's kind of where Klaus Nomi and this whole generation of new wave artists come from, uh, Joey Arias along with him. Um, so Klaus Nomi comes Joey up. Joey Arias so, is that old? Yeah, it's hard like, to imagine. Yeah, but yeah. Oh, yeah. What? Yeah, believe it or not, Joey Arias actually had a little tiny record that was a small hit called Burgerette <laughs> as like a garage rock band. Yeah, it's totally nuts. Uh, and then after that, after he left L.A., he came to New York. And not too long later, he and Klaus met up and became this crazy ass duo. Um And Klaus had already been like, he came from Germany. He was somewhat trained classically in opera, although the real pedigree, as it turns out, is more like he happened to be an usher at the opera in Germany. And I guess that translates to lessons. But either way, he was amazing. And he was this falsetto vocalist, which was like, nowadays, there's uh, roles for what are called countertenors in um, Baroque opera, like opera from the 1700s when there were male lead singers who, before they were pubescent, uh, had their testicles removed. Um, Those roles hadn't had anyone who was really able to sing them for a long time, and so they kind of went by the wayside, because there's a very particular type of voice that there's a lot of history about that Mm -hmm. has to do with what they... The castrati. Yeah, yeah, the castrati. What they physically developed were like larger thoracic cavities, smaller heads, et cetera, et cetera. So at any rate, so this falsetto thing kind of went by the wayside as far as anything other than popular music, where it was really more like in hillbilly music or in like doo-wop. So then where Klaus comes in is there's this new sort of developing downtown area of sort of burned out buildings and old bars that aren't doing very well. And one of them becomes Club 57, and right before it becomes Club 57, uh, Ann Magnuson, uh, who was a performance artist and she was a television actress, um, her and some other people put together something called the New Wave Vaudeville. And it was this four day long thing where they asked for like every kind of freaky, weird street person or performer, didn't matter what you were doing, come and do it and we'll let you do it. So most of it was a bunch of nonsense and kind of silly. But then one of the last things to happen was Klaus Nomi comes on stage. And when he comes on, he's singing this uh, classical opera falsetto, beautiful soprano piece that I think was originally a Maria Callas recording. Um, And everyone thought that he was lip syncing and he's dressed like an alien. He has like this rain slicker on that's like goes out geometrically like a giant triangle at the bottom And it bows out like a huge vampire collar on top. And then he has his hair blacked and into like three points. um, And he has his little black lips. Mm -hmm. And he's wearing like a black leotard kind of costume. Is this the classic kind of like Klaus Nomi look that we've kind of come to get from him? It's right before that. Okay. Well, it's right Klaus, before that. Klaus Nomi was very much inspired by uh, the Russian futurists. Who uh, yes. created uh, these Bauhaus. weird Thou House movement, uh, and most famously with the Victory Over the Sun, a futurist opera with, by the Russian avant garde with all these angular kind of costumes that sort of yeah. fought against the human body. And when they showed this opera, a scandal broke out. What and happened? People just rioted in the streets. They were like, we can't take this art. This art is too radical. This is going to bring down civilization itself. 
That's how strong yeah, people it. felt about it. No, it just <laughs> no <laughs> didn't do anything. Just critics freaking out, nineteen mm. twenty style. Mm. The thing um, about it is, is like when you think about you know we have so much media today to to reflect upon and to consume and stuff. But back you know even even in David Bowie's time, you know when he and Klaus Nomi uh, went on Saturday Night Live, um, there was very little. You know, there's only like four. Uh, broadcast channels on television, mm -hmm. and so it was. It was a big deal to have David Bowie being this gender nonconforming artist with Klaus Nomi and these, you know, gay, um, you know, gender bisexual uh, performance artists on television. What happens is he comes out, he sings this song, he stands still and does these kind of robotic gestures, and there's smoke and lights, and everybody thinks that at first that it's a he's lip syncing. Um, cause they assume he's a drag act and, in this traditional sense. And then it turns out that he's not. And everybody goes, holy shit, we need to see more of Klaus Nomi. That was the most crazy ass thing we've ever seen. And Joey Arias and then, um, uh, Kenny Scharf and several other people all join up in this team called the Nomis. And they become these alien people who live on stage and off stage in the same way that they ha were emulating David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust. So like he was Ziggy Stardust all the time when he became that character. And so they wanted to do the same thing. They slept in a tube, they ate space food, whatever that means. Is that uh, where Lady Gaga got her sleeping in a, uh, an egg from? <laughs> I'm sure it's one of the places, mm -hmm. that or one of the Michael Jackson hyperbaric chamber things. <laughs> well, it seems That's like a lot guess. of performance artists have always sort of wanted to sleep in little pods and crawl There's something out of dramatic those about Hatch. I mean, it's that yeah. whole thing about creating, creating yourself and coming out of an egg, you know? And I mean, before Madonna was even around, it's like sort of the David Bowie was the the godfather of of reinventing yourself, wasn't he? Oh yeah, David Bowie and Cher, to me, are like the two people. But Cher's were like reinvention in moment to moment to moment to moment to moment to moment. Whereas David Bowie was a full recreation, like a whole new era every time something new comes. Mm -hmm. And I and, think that and, was and like, the reason he did this is because, you know, uh, you know, obviously because he's a very creative person, but also too to just kind of get people reinterested in him again. Right. Because you kind of, you know, yeah. people say, oh, I know that, you know, and then they, you know, you want something else. You hear something brand new because we always want something brand new and shiny. Well, it's easier to yeah. connect with an audience when they're like they think they've got you figured out. They think they know what to expect from you and you give them something completely different. It gets people talking. It gets people curious about your work again. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why Lady Gaga has has done this whole like I'm everything she does is kind of in the wake of Madonna and David Bowie because it's that whole recreate new sound, new image every time she comes out with a new thing, and it's always something that's a pretty hard left turn from the last thing. And then, um, what's is there a relationship? Because in, in preparing for the show, you're you're telling there's a relationship between Charles Bush and Klaus Nomi. Yeah, so both of them come up through. Uh, there's a guy named Charles Ludlum who creates this um, ridiculous theater that is sort of an anarchist, sort of strange performance art theater based in combining sort of really high art concepts with really low ball, low brow kind of stuff. Um, and you know, shit jokes and, and Shakespeare, you know, in a certain sense, that's a gross over, uh, um, that's a, a, over summing up, but that kind of gets to the point. Um, and so both of them come through his theater and learn a lot about, he has like a whole manifesto and all these particular rules of how to do this kind of theater. Um, and they both come up through there and learn a lot about how to create a stage show out of nothing, which is what had the Ludlum's Ridiculous Theater Company was, was really doing at the time. So, yeah. So, Charles Bush, I think right after that, ends up doing Vampire Lesbians of Sodom, which becomes like, I think it runs for like 280 weeks or something um, off off Broadway. And right after that is when Klaus Nomi starts to rise up through the the new wave nightlife scene uh, through Club 57 and Danceteria and all these different places. And so Charles Ludlum sort of uh, had very much of a drag sensibility 
that uh, influence a, a wide variety of uh, theat- theater cor- theater artists like Charles Bush um, with Vampire Lesbians of Sodom, but also he influenced very much um, the Rocky Horror production and its its own camp aesthetics. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it's it's you know that's one of the things that's kind of I hope will come forward as more people start to do work like I'm doing is that really what you see when you look at even one single place like New York city, I mean, granted New York city is a hell of a lot, but it's one place really. Mm. And as far as that goes, like just looking at the history that I'm looking at, most of it is coming through like three or four clubs. If I went around the corner and down the block, I could write a whole other history about drag. Like, my whole dissertation kind of walks around the pyramid and just uses it as a, as a part of RuPaul's story, because I was like, you know, that part of the story has been written more than anything else. So people have somewhere else they can be referred to for that. But like this Charles Ludlum stuff, it's there, but it's kind of buried in theater work Mm -hmm. that you have to dig through to even come across. And his work is really, really important. And that's kind of like what I'm hoping to see more of is people you know, digging out these other stories too. And I just want to draw attention to uh, one of probably the most influential work of Charles Ludlum is the mystery of Irma Vep, which yes. is an anagram for, uh, what is the, the Les Vampires. And the concept of this play was that it was two actors and between them, each of them played eight characters of both sexes. So in order to ensure cross-dressing, um, the, the actors must be of the same sex and had quick costume changes, which created this wonderful illusion about, it was about like, um, between 30 to 40 costume changes in a two hour show that led to shoot kids in the halls, uh, cross-dressing sensibility and certainly like, um, uh, greater tuna in, in Texas right now, the, the Joe Sears and Jason Williams's uh, production. And just this whole clever idea of having a small group of performers cross dressing all the characters to, for, with hilarious consequences. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's, it's amazing how, how wide and, and deep the influence of some of these things is because like club 57, the club that, uh, that, um, you know, Joey Arias and Klaus Nomi are coming through the sensibilities that come up through it are what end up being called, being called, um, kitschadelic. Um, and the, the influences there show up in delight. They show up in Nickelodeon television from the nineties, uh, in all the cartoons, and Nickelodeon, uh, yeah, I mean, the B-52s are the theme song to Rocco's Modern Life. Like, Mark Mothersbaugh, who was, you know, in Devo, writes half the theme songs for those TV shows. It's insane how deep all these things from the new wave scene are in mainstream America, mostly because of one thing. Television needed cheap stuff to put on the airwaves. And these people coming out of the new wave scene were like, sure, we can help you produce something for the cost of nothing. You know, and so like we end up with shows like when I was a kid, like Kablam, a TV show that's made out of all stop motion of just like knockoff brand toys, <laughs> you know, or Stick Stickly, the host who is literally a popsicle stick. And cer- and certainly like New Wave gave rise to postmodernism, which sort of, I mean, deeply influenced uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse. And oh, yeah. Pee Wee's Playhouse yeah. is like huge in everything that we're talking about here. Because all those people were coming through the groundlings. And guess who else came through the groundlings? Joey Arias. Elvira. And Elvira. Yeah. So like all these people, it's crazy how these little sources of these just little like creative powerhouses like the groundlings, like Club 57, like the pyramid, um, you know, like the tunnel were producing just like shitloads of creative people who were able to go out and do something with what they made at this little bar that costs, you know, not that much in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Well, New York was a much different place at that time. You know, it was the, what was it? It was the the 70s into the 80s. There was a lot of white flight. Uh, that East Lower East Side was, you know, a cheaper place for people to live. And so what exactly. we know artists uh, need the most is cheap rent. Well, and, and also to me, what really strikes me about that cultural time period is so many um comedians and performers and actors 
wanted to be known only as the creations they had made. So like Elvira and Paul Rubens and RuPaul and Max Headroom. I'm thinking of uh, Klaus Nomi, certainly to this degree, David Bowie. They didn't want to do interviews out of their costumes. They wanted yeah. to be seen as these fantastical creatures they that lived every day of their lives. And so every time we see them like making uh, videos or films or whatever, we see the this this uh, really magical universe that the character inhabits. You know, and certainly like yeah. uh, Elvira's film, uh, what is it? Um, uh, is that is a great Mistress of the Dark? I think is the the most. Yep. Uh, we see, you know, the world created by Elvira, but also, you know, Pee Wee's Big Adventure also has that same approach that, like, Pee Wee wakes up out of bed as Pee Wee Herman. RuPaul wakes up out of bed with all the curls and all mm-hmm. the blonde hair. We never, we don't even get to see RuPaul out of drag until much later in his career. Like, that was not a, something that was, RuPaul never did interviews out of drag. Yeah, and even like something as mundane and straightforward as like Ernest goes to camp. Doesn't that guy did didn't he do all his interviews as Ernest? Jim Verne, yeah. He, yeah, I yeah. thought so. Yeah, it was, yeah, it so was that's like, like another it was thing right around the same time. And even when we started doing this mm-hmm. podcast, we had a really hard time interviewing uh performers and comedians and actors because they didn't want to get out of their character to do the interview. Mm-hmm. And like I'm thinking about Miss Richfield. Sure. Um, I'm thinking about um, a the, lot of the early drag queens that we interviewed. They wanted to be like, this is my character. That's who I, uh, that's who I am. Don't refer that's to me as my I, boy. But you know what? A huge yeah. game changer for a lot of that stuff was Facebook uh, because that whole real name policy and then people having to like, you know, being more comfortable. And also I think also to the advance of gay rights to a lot of people that were queer were like, uh, listen, I, I don't want to get fired from my day job so this is my character and that's it i don't want my real life put out there so yeah and it's it's a whole thing with that whole like era that we were talking about of drag because really like that's one of the central things that i talk about as far as the history and one of the things that changes that's so important um that makes drag more marketable is that it's not reliant upon an impersonation like every other kind of drag like so much of the drag that came before was either impersonation of you know it was the standard like what i would think of now more of like as tourist drag like you know if you go to a tourist bar in florida and it's primarily like straight couples in their 50s the show you're gonna see or if it's vegas or wherever the show you're gonna see is like a lot of impersonators and then a lot of glamour like it's all kind of very old school drag Mm -hmm. but then what happens when all these queens who are inspired by 1960s television like rupaul like lady bunny like joey arias like all these people um, what you start getting is these characters that are caricatures that are creations of those people, like you were saying, that they live and occupy in, you know, Misunderstood, Perfidia, um, Lady Bunny, RuPaul, uh, even, you know, uh, women who do this, like, um, uh, what's her name from D-Light, Lady Miss Keir. Um, You know, there's a whole lot of this character creation thing that's a changeover. That's a huge changeover in drag because it now means you don't have to worry about that person's career, that person's image, its ups and downs, because mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. You yeah. can now, everything's dependent on you. you. Back in the day, there was a, you know, there was a thousand uh, Judy Garland impersonators, but now there's like, there's not so many because just the demand is not there anymore. And people have for- yeah. forgotten who Judy Garland is, mm. which is a, horrible thing to say but it's you know sadly well it's becoming just like true. i think part of it is like you know if you if there's 800 videos of really amazing judy garland impersonators from the last 30 years on youtube what are you going to bring to the table as a new judy garland impersonator that we haven't seen 800 times because if i if you're going to bring me something new then by all means bring me the fucking judy like i will eat it up with a bowl uh but most of the time, you know, do I want to see somebody do the same bit I've seen as a talent in a pageant 800 times? Probably not. But, you know, we don't want to see another reiteration of the exact same thing. Do something new with it. And what about Boy George and Lee Bowery? So Lee Bowery is kind of an interesting character because even the people, he's not part of the new romantic scene proper because that happens like in the early 80s almost at the same time as New Wave is happening and Klaus Nomi and Joey Arias are happening. Lee Bowery comes along in like 84, 80, really like 85 into like any kind of a big position. Um, And by the time he's come along, 
sort of what the new romantics in London started off as like a little tiny club night called Billy at the Blitz or Billy's Bowie night at the Blitz. Um, and it started off at a place before that called Billy's. Um, and it grew to like several hundred people became this huge successful night where the music was all mixed. And it was all like, you might hear David Bowie. You might hear some, uh, German, uh, music like craft work. Uh, you could hear like any sort of kind of a thing. And everybody was dressing up in these really beautiful costumes that they were getting, uh, by making fashion out of stuff from thrift stores and a lot of stuff from this one big costuming store that had historical costumes that closed down. So everybody bought a bunch of stuff for really cheap in like bin sales, basically. Um, and so that becomes its own, uh, world by the sense that it starts to produce, there's, you get like these magazines, um, that all deal with taking photos and reporting on the nightlife in London. That's based around this new romantic movement. It becomes really, really huge kind of like, Disco did after Saturday Night Live, so everybody from the suburbs starts coming in. The clubs don't really resemble what they were supposed to anymore. And by then, Lee Bowery shows up, but with the sensibilities of a new romantic who takes everything into a crazy direction. And all those people who had been part of that scene, like Boy George and Steve Strange and Rusty Egan, uh, all sort of flock around Lee Bowery. And he has sort of an explosive moment in the sun for a few years. Um, because what he does is totally tears apart everything about what drag means. He's morphing the body into weird, grotesque shapes, covering up the head with, you know, crinolines and Bart Simpson masks and, um, exploding, you know, gigantic stomachs. He's giving birth to, to his wife, Nicola Bowery, uh, you know, while saying all you need is love by the Beatles. Um, <laughs> well, they're screaming it out. They're not, they're not just singing it. They're just like, all you need is love. Exactly. And then on top of that, doing stuff like, uh, you know, starting like Minty, uh, his music group and singing a song about a lesbian bar called fist and singing a song called useless man that is filthy and amazing and like hard and fast and like, metal just sort of experimenting with all kinds of different things and most significantly is that lee not only owns his own nightclub that becomes sort of a, a magical and horrifying place he also gets taken seriously by the legitimate art world as it is and he is invited to do his thing painted up behind a uh, two pane or the you know two-way glass where the audience outside in the gallery can look in on him, but he can't see them. And he basically just preens in front of a mirror on a divan that he's laying on for many, many hours every day. People start to realize this is more than just drag. There's something more to this. And Lee Bowery studies are kind of their own thing. Um, there's not a ton, but there's enough. But Lee... Lee really changed the game altogether. And Lee is really, if we want to trace club kids back to something specific, it goes back to Lee because it was when Lee came over. That's really when Michael Alec and James St. James are really starting to do something with that is after they see Lee when he comes over in like 85. Mm. And so meanwhile, in the late sixties, uh, communes start developing all across the urban landscape and especially most famously in San Francisco and at the hate Ashbury uh, district. And one very famous commune was cauliflower, which was the home of many hippie artists, men and women who formed a group called the Coquettes and uh, gave rise to one of the greatest drag legends, Sylvester, who you guys all know for her song, You Made Me Feel Mad Real. <laughs> yes. I yes. love some Sylvester. That's one of my favorite days when I used to teach history of rock and roll. Why were, they, why were these hippies so gender nonconforming? Like, because they could have, you know, we certainly could have seen a lot of countercultural people being very cisgendered, very mm. uh, traditional, at least in what, roles men and women played, but for the Coquettes, they were very interested in being outrageous. 
Yeah, the Cockettes were really all about breaking down every barrier that you could think of. They, in their commune, there were adults um, down to babies. There were straight people. There were queer people. There were gay people. There were whatever you could think of. And the whole point was just to live freely and live with each other and love each other and do a shitload of drugs and have a good time and... You know, that was really what it was about and and uh, living the commune lifestyle. And well, so and, and certainly like Peaches Christ and, and, and all her productions, you know, Heclina and Tranny Shack and now Mother very much trace their origins and their history to this scene. But what's really fascinating is that like Peaches Christ travels around the country and does these really, you know, very psychedelic um, hippie inspired tributes to some of the greatest camp films of all time. Yet the Coquettes, when they went to New York city, they were booed. They, they were rejected and, oh, yeah. read, and ran out of town. Yeah, hardcore, because the whole thing, the whole aesthetic was entirely not New York. So New York, there was a lot of weird shit going on, but things had a lot of structure. Things were often a little bit messy, but like, for instance, like Klaus and Joey's shows, when they started off, were very orchestrated, but they were just Joey. But by the time there were four or five people working on it, there were people, you know, whose only job was to build set pieces for this show. So, on the other hand, this communal kind of version of a show is, you know, a lot of people, it's very front-loaded with LSD uh, taken by most of the performers. And the so, audience. And the audience. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that the audience in New York got that memo. Um, so they showed and, up sober, but the performers were high. Yeah, and I, that kind of, to me, seems to be like part of the issue is that it seems like the people who came to New York, you know, Angela Lansbury was there. And I love Angela <laughs> Lansbury. But, like, I kind of think that they were oh. looking for, like, a queer Broadway tribute a la hair. Mm -hmm. And instead they got, like, a bunch of messy hippies who just were really messed up and, like, having a good time and throwing glitter around and, you know, being nuts. And there's not a lot of structure to it, you know? It's like a very freeform kind of thing. And so I think their response was, yeah, get the hell out of New York and go back to San Francisco, you bunch of dirty hippies. And um, they did, they were fine once they went back to San Francisco, but it With just their did tail not between their legs. I mean, they were very, I think the, the group suffered tremendously about it. You know? Yeah, in the long run, that was when the split started, I believe, that formed uh, the Angels of Light, which was, if I remember correctly, uh, don't quote me on this. I believe the reason why the Angels of Light split off had something to do with um, that one of the, the the one faction wanted to get paid and the other group wanted it to continue to be something that was for the community, by the community, communal style, no payment. And I think that kind of split off. And then I think Hibiscus, who was the head of all of them, uh, who had started the thing, uh, went with the Angels of Light and then I think in, eventually tore off onto his own group from that too and for people who don't know who hibiscus is uh out of drag uh, she she was a anti-war protester most famously that photo that was printed in time magazine of her putting a flower into the rifle of a soldier it, it was sort of defined that generation and hibiscus also was very well known in the new york city fashion industry as a as a male model and was rejected by the coquettes and and was kicked out of the coquettes like and i've noticed he was that, too beautiful well cuz you know they were kind of jealous of his own independent success and i think you know the coquettes also had sort of a love hate relationship with the uh, and they really, they don't really talk about this too much but um, and even in the documentaries to this day, it's kind of taboo topic. But they were a little jealous of Sylvester too, you know. I, I could imagine. I yeah. definitely felt like the the documentary is really fun, but leaves a lot of information untold. Um, well, and I, this I is uh, something that, that was I said about the Harold book, and I still haven't read it. <laughs> this is something that was said about Harold Washington most recently by uh, a lot of conservative politicians. Uh, Harold Washington was the United States' first black 
mayor and in Chicago certainly um, changed the political landscape in making politicians more interested in diversity and becoming accountable to people on the margins of society. And um, the reason that Harold Washington and and people like Sylvester and, and Hibiscus and any kind of these uh, leaders uh, who are very uh, unconventional and very progressive minded leaders are celebrating their death. Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the most unpopular uh, political leaders of his day when he died at the time that he died. Um, but they're celebrated because they said that the dead cannot lead, that the dead have no political impact. But the reason that Martin Luther King Jr. and versus uh, Harold Washington um, is, you know, celebrated and have a national holiday about it is because in Mar uh, Harold Washington to this day still influences people on the political landscape in a way that Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, really never was able to. And so it's the idea of that these really um, influential figures, we don't celebrate them as much today because of the fact that they still have a powerful impact on us. And, you know, it, it was this idea of it's an interesting thing, problem that a lot of LGBT artists have faced throughout these generations, which is that we want to reach a wide audience. We want to be accepted and embraced by our society. And yet at the same time, the process of doing that means letting go a little bit of our uniqueness and our individuality and our, and our um, community. And so like, this is a, a, a criticism I've seen of, of RuPaul throughout my life is that RuPaul sold out by going mainstream and having a chart topping hit. Like she was mainstream uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> Right. And, and even well, you know, I mean, RuPaul's the thing about RuPaul is, yeah. is mm -hmm. every time somebody says that, I mean, I have a lot of feelings myself about RuPaul personally. But if you're going to like bring that to the table, then you have to just own up to the fact that like read your first book. She's real fucking clear. I don't give a shit. And I'm in this for me. And I will do anything in order to become famous. Whatever they want me to do, I will do it. Like she is very, very, very repeatedly clear about that. And that she does not give any fucks. And like, so you can hold somebody accountable to something that they said they'd be accountable for. But I kind of feel like my feelings about Rue are mixed to death by having written about her this extensively. Um, because she represented something to me growing up and she represents something to me on the national scene now. But, you know, like she's a person. So my feelings are going to be complicated because I have feelings that are complicated about most human beings. Um, so let's talk about the the uh, the atmosphere that allowed a song like Supermodel to become a chart topping hit. Because you know in New York City there there was a a, a power couple Suzanne Barched and her uh, bodybuilder husband David Barton who did these happenings. And Suzanne yeah. is still working to this day. She was uh, I guess she was very instrumental in in giving Milk and the Dairy Queens their own. Is that what Milt's friends are called? I, I think they're the Dairy Queens, right? I, think I believe so. so, yes. Yeah, um, uh, you know, uh, you Who and uh, other drag queens like uh, around their start. But Suzanne Barsh cr uh, was very much instrumental in creating the atmosphere that led to RuPaul becoming a sensation, right? Yeah, so Suzanne Barsh comes to New York. She's already been like a big deal as a, as a fashion designer who crochets stuff for like rock stars before this in London. And then she moves to um, America and then uh, about in 84, I think she throws the first of her weekly parties. Cause she's like, basically she came out of the new romantic nightlife scene that boy George was in that I was talking about. And she comes over here and she's like, nightlife was so crazy and weird and different where I'm from. Why is it not like that here? I want to do that. So she starts throwing these weekly parties, uh, Savage and like Michael Musto starts showing up, everybody starts showing up because the magic of what she's doing mm -hmm. is combining sort of high culture, low culture stuff all under one roof um, and having like many different experiences that you can have in one particular place. So you have like drag queens, you have strippers, you've got uh, all kinds of people that are different who are hired to be, you know, the color for the room essentially. Um you know, something pretty to look at and fun to talk to. And so this fosters this, you know, incredible nightlife. And key to this, why it's so important, 
is this is one of the first times that people can get real money to pay their fucking bills with because Suzanne Barsh is actually paying people and paying them decently. So you can like go out and be RuPaul and work for Suzanne Barsh, you know, multiple times nights a week mm-hmm. and bring home enough money to pay your actual rent. And that's the real key. And that's so much of like, you know, why it's so hard to do drag and be a drag queen is because mm-hmm. a lot of times, you know, the community for a long time has not supported it. And uh, a lot of people won't necessarily pay for it. And that's why they need every dollar that they can get when they are out there uh, dancing because it costs so much just to put on drag. I think Kim Chi said in an article recently that to even if you wanted to start from zero and you had nothing and you wanted to come out like a really well looking good queen, it would cost you at least 600 bucks. And I I don't know. Oh, easily. Any at club least it's going to pay most girls 600 bucks to show up, you know? No. No. You're lucky but Suzanne like, Barsh was was unique in that way that she mm-hmm. was spending considerable amount of money yeah. just to encourage people to dress up in a weird costume and show up at her club events. And that she was paying people that were considered to be like on the same like social ladder level as like sex workers. And she had a lot of sex workers working for her as well. So she's got like drag queens, she's got strippers, she's got, you know, everybody, um, but she's paying them real money that they can actually survive on. And that's like, you know, like we said, that's, that's pivotal. That's crucial because that again, gives you more of a better place to position yourself when you're looking for the next gig up because like, you know, most nightclubs before this, and frankly, now, like you were saying, keep you in a place where you are never able to have enough money sitting behind you that you can leverage yourself up to that next level of doing what you're trying to do. You know what I mean? Uh, Jenny Livingston, she was a a graduate student at at, at New York City in film school, and she decided to, she was was a lesbian woman uh, who was interested in gender nonconforming performers in the underground ball scene. And so she made this very powerful, influential documentary, Paris is Burning. Um, Why, you know, there were other documentaries and other films made about, uh, you know, drag queens and ball uh, performances. Why was Paris is Burning so different in the way it was received? Paris is Burning came along at a crucial time, and Jenny Livingston happened to seize upon the right thing in the right moment. It's really, I think. She got lucky. Yeah, she got lucky. Um, I think, well, I'd say she made an educated guess. I'll put it that way. Because I think there's there's an element of her recognizing something was on the level and coming up. But most of it is seeing that and going, aha, I can be the one. Um, So what happens with Jenny is. Number one, there's so many problems with the way she approached the entire scene. If you watch other documentaries, uh, like How Do I Look, which was produced and the money was given back to the ball scene. Um, What you see is people who are going to college, people who are going to school, people who are doing a lot of different things their lives. But none of that was represented in that movie because when she came in, her people literally came in and said, you know, we're looking for the prostitutes. We're looking for drug addicts. We're looking for... And then they're manufacturing some narratives mm. so that that is what appears to be. So you see a lot of people with a lot of achievements that were in that movie, in the, in the movie, How Do I Look? Um, and you're like, wait a second. This is the same person that was shown to me in this other movie. It's very, very uh, it, powerful to see How Do I Look. It's, it's produced much more cheaply, but it is a really, really great documentary as far as watching the ballroom scene actually respond to Paris is burning, you know, uh, two decades later, I think is when it was made like 2010. What was, was, how do I look, have the same level of wonderful catchphrases and moments like touch the skin, honey, touch this all over. I am a goddess and you're just an overgrown orangutan. Or no, now I will like say, shade or, mm-hmm. cause that's what I was going to say. The other thing is as problematic as Paris is burning is it's also still important. It's problematic. But it still taught, for one thing, it was at least a thing that like black gay kids can see and be like, oh, look, there are other people like me. Like there are not, try and think of how many black gay images from the 90s or 80s that there are that aren't the two guys on In Living Color that are two straight guys. Mm. 
Yeah, it was certainly very powerful. And, you know, me going through art school as an undergraduate and as a grad student, God, I must have seen Paris is Burning about 20 times. Yeah, I saw uh, many, many, many. I mean, I've watched all these movies before I did this research. I've already seen, you know, these are just movies I love. Um, and despite their problematic nature, there's also some amazing things that people don't ever think about. One of my favorite things um, about Paris is Burning is watching that moment where Dorian Corey says, you never know what skeletons people have in their closet. <laughs> no one has a mummy in her closet. <laughs> like, Do, was it there when you said it? Was that why you said I it? Think, I think they said it. I think they say she was, it was there, right? Yep, I, I hope so. Uh, but I do we so. ever find so, out? Do we know who that body is? All that I know is that the rumor of who it seems to have been was a guy who did a bunch of horrible shit to people and maybe raped some people. So mm. it seems like there was a reason why she did what she did. So mm. I'm cool with that if that's the case. <laughs> I mean, according as of taping this right now, I'm looking. Uh, there is no the bodies. I guess was identified as Robert Bobby Worley, mm. who um, the uh, uh, and he had a bunch of criminal records uh, uh, raping and assaulting women in the 60s. Yeah, see. So he was probably a figure that was harming. I mean, I don't want to, you know, we don't know. But and maybe Dorian Corey was, you know, even uh, she I mean, was, I wouldn't be surprised because Dorian everywhere people she don't realize. Went. We don't know. We just don't <laughs> know. Here's the thing. People don't it. realize Dorian was a big deal. Like Dorian, mm. you can buy on eBay like a, a vinyl, you know, a record of um, it's like a comedy record. That's pretty much just a bunch of drag queens cutting up backstage. Mm. Um, that's that has her on it from like, I want to say that's 69 or oh, wow. something. I didn't realize that, you know, that was out there until last year, a year before. Um, but yeah, sure. Dorian was kind of like a huge deal. She was, uh, she toured with the Jewel Box Review, which was like a huge, big name um, touring company of those like nightclub shows. Um, so like, she's someone that once upon a time, you would have been able to like buy a piece of memorability with her face on it. Mm. And then. So she'd she been around for a long time. She, yeah, she had some experience. And so if he came at her, she was like, this is not my first day here. That's wow. kind of what I think is wow. that there's was probably like, a, oh, girl, I'm not the one. And Dorian seems like not the one. Mm. <laughs> so Paris is Burning is released in 1991. Then a little black girl from the Brewster Projects. Well, actually, uh, RuPaul was from Atlanta, Georgia and CNA. living in, in California and stuff like that. Yeah. But she decided with her friend Larry T and uh, RuPaul was dating one of the songwriters for supermodel. Is that, is that, that's, that's part of the thing. Like a lot of people don't talk about is that supermodel. You better work was produced by, um, Jimmy, Harry, Larry T and RuPaul and Eric Correct. Cooper. And RuPaul fell, you know, RuPaul, like all great entertainers and artists, have falling outs with people, you know. And, and I think RuPaul also didn't own the rights, full rights to Supermodel You Better Work. And that's part of the reason we've never seen RuPaul sort of, uh, you know, acknowledging the, the, the anniversary of that mm. song. Um, well, she using that yeah, song she only owns, she, she either she owns plays half it down, the rights definitely. or a third of the rights. But, you know, that song is iconic, but like the reality is money wise, it did OK, but it was that's top spot on Billboard was number 45. And so in, in the process of uh, recording the song, they they reached out to comedian and actress LaWanda Page from best known for her appearances as Aunt Esther on the Sanford and Son yes. and had her, uh, you know, pretty much sing half of the song. Work the runway, sweetie. That's that's not RuPaul. That's LaWanda Page. That's her too. Yeah, I don't know how much her check for that is, but I wonder because it had to have been pretty sizable. Because they Ru said the only reason they got that line on there that tell the man with the money to come here and pay me was because she walked in the door and said that, and Ru was like, "We're putting that on the record." <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. And, and, and fascinatingly enough, and this is one thing I discovered from you is that. RuPaul had recorded the whole album and then started shopping it around to different record labels and could not find somebody to buy it. Yeah, nobody was interested. And it's still so bizarre that the record label that picked it up was Tommy Boy. Like a record label that's known for all like hip hop and rap artists at that point. And they're like, 
Yeah, I guess RuPaul, this eight foot tall blonde black drag queen. Yeah, this Why seems not? like. It. And uh, sure enough, Monica Lynch calls them up, and uh, Monica Lynch was the president of hip hop. Uh, she was the president of, of um, Tommy Boy. Of Tommy Boy, and she's a blonde white lady, and who's had signed a bunch of different people that were really big uh, uh, sellers. Um, that like I'm who? Up. I cannot think of sure. off the top of my. Um, but she signed RuPaul and said, you know, we don't have a lot of money, but we want to make this work. So like the first big thing they really did was again, going back to RuPaul's roots in like guerrilla marketing, um, and to make the music video for, um, for supermodel, they just kind of like grabbed two camera people, ran into downtown and started improvising stuff. And there were a bunch of kids getting off of school who were in uniform and so they were like, let's just grab them and bring them in. So that's how we get that like iconic shot of the like, you know, 20 foot tall RuPaul and her, you know, that red Zaldi uh, swimsuit with the train thing with the like four kids on each side of her at that water fountain. And then the rest of it is like, you know, really what I love about that music video is RuPaul always says that she's like a sampling machine for pop, like for pop culture. And when you watch that video, it's mostly just her doing Gloria Swanson in Sunset Boulevard. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm. Like every gesture, every facial move, like half of that video is just her doing Gloria Swanson and nobody ever mentions it. <laughs> and I'm like, it's just her doing Gloria Swanson the whole video. I'm going to have to rewatch that and look at it. Yeah, you're so oh, yeah. wrong. Right. I mean, about that. Well, you know, they're, right? class, like they're the classic second, looks. I'm ready for my yeah, close-up, Mr. Yeah, the first time DeMille. I saw Sunset Boulevard, I was like, RuPaul took everything well, from that entire video from And this. certainly that video owes a lot to Madonna's uh, video oh, yeah. Vogue. And certainly yeah, is, is a direct, you know, reference to yes. that. I mean, the use of black and white footage, the close-up shots, the the reference to supermodels. You know, Madonna's Vogue uh, rapped yes. about Hollywood legends and and RuPaul in interviews said, you know, these are these are my legends as these cover girls. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what RuPaul did to become famous, if you boil it down to how supermodel goes kaboom, is RuPaul took the quotable lines and funny bits from Paris is Burning, mixed it with Madonna's Vogue, uh, put a giant blonde wig with pin curls all over it, and made a superstar. And this uh, would have never happened if it wasn't for Monica Lynch? That's correct. But really, like one of the people I want to make sure I talk about before we're before we finish anything is, um, you know, we were talking about how do we get to the point of Paris is burning and how did she know what was going on? Really, what was going on was Willie Ninja was already kicking everybody's ass. Mm -hmm. um, Willie Ninja, by the by that time, had done Liz Torres. Um, there was a song that was a ballroom hit called Still a Thrill. Uh, he choreographed the music video for that part of it. Uh, then he was asked by Taylor Dane to choreograph Bobby Brown in Tell It to My Heart. And even though magazines call it voguing, uh, Willie Ninja will be is, was the first one to point out that Bobby Brown couldn't vogue to save his life. Ah. So not really recognizable mm. as such. Um, but then, let's see, then uh, Malcolm McLaren from the Sex Pistols, to go back to that connection too, uh, he was the manager of the Sex Pistols, creator of the Sex Pistols, and was uh, Vivian Westwood, you know, punk fashion designer, uh, her husband, and was also an incredibly influential punk fashion designer. Uh, he had already had a hit by combining hip hop music, uh, like sampling ideas with classical music. Why do that, you say? Because classical music is free if you get an early enough recording. Mm. So, right, the punk thing. So then he does this again by uh, doing a song that is all about voguing called Deep in Vogue. But he features Willie Ninja in the music video and two other Vogers. And then even after that, and that was a hit. Like, that was a number one dance hit. So Madonna knew that existed, and nobody ever brings that up. Mm. Um, and then on top of that, and it was maybe six, mm, like one year? ahead of her. And then right after that, between them was Queen Latifah did come into my house 
and also uh, playing off of the house ballroom house house idea. Um, also did uh, have Willie Ninja and like three or four other Vogers in that video too. So it was something that was already on the up and the up and the up and the up and the up. So, so uh, you know, Michelle Visage likes to say that uh, Madonna saw her voguing at some club, and that's where Madonna got the idea for, for voguing. Michelle Visage so. is crazy. <laughs> Michelle Visage would like to insert herself in the middle of history because Michelle Visage would like to be a lot bigger of a deal than than perhaps history would have her be. So even saying that, uh, even saying Madonna, is, you know, ripped off uh, voguing from Paris is Burning is not true. It really, she was aware of it long before because other people had already been doing it. Other major stars, Queen Latifah, and uh, yeah, Bobby I mean, Brown. like that's and like that's something that really, like, if I've said this before and I'll say it again, if one thing is printed on my tombstone, let it be: <laughs> Madonna and Jenny Livingston were not what made voguing popular. <laughs> like that's not how and and here's that's, the other thing I can't wait watch to see Madonna's music stone. video and you show me <laughs> voguing in that video because putting your hands around your face does not a voguer make mm. and she ain't doing it in the rest of the video well other people are though right sort of yeah. check it out right. check it out well, the idea that evoking and then really ask yourself are they just like posing a, like a person who's being photographed mm -hmm. for a magazine mm -hmm. and that's at the yeah, core making love to the camera yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so she takes work, the honey. ideas. But, you know, and the other thing that's really like the thing that sucks most about that song is like, OK, so the ballroom comes into existence literally as a response to racist pageants mm. in 1969 or so. Mm. Um, there's like what we see in the Queen with Crystal LaBeja yelling at Flawless Sabrina. Um, and then right after that, basically, Queens had been expected to whiten up their face, whiten up their skin all of this to be competitive. And then they still usually wouldn't win no matter how good they were. Sure. So that's why the ballroom came into existence. Literally the place for voguing arises comes into existence as a response to racism. And then your thing that you're going to tell the world is it doesn't matter if you're black or white, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Like you missed the point, honey. Like you really missed the point of what mm -hmm. this whole. And, and so, that sure. sucks. Mm -hmm. And so with RuPaul, it's it's hard to underestimate just the sensation that Supermodel had, it, you know, and it seemed like everybody wanted to work with RuPaul. RuPaul was like the go to gal for the gay community for I mean, you know, we had a, a march on Washington in 1993 in that summer. And, you know, probably one of the most recognizable and memorable speeches of that uh, March Was for, is RuPaul dressed up as Wonder Woman uh, speaking before the, the you know the Capitol steps and, and really um, RuPaul seems to says be, we're going to paint the White House pink and and she seemed un unstoppable until her she was paired with Milton Berle for the yep. MTV Music Awards and and Milton Berle. Uh, starts, you know, allegedly he backstage was being very obnoxious to RuPaul, and in, in some uh, in some recollections of the, of the story was wanting to show RuPaul his dick. Why? Well, so I he was sexually harassing right. RuPaul, and RuPaul was not taking. A, 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 you know, she was not, not having liking, it. She was not Mil having it. Milton Burrow was, was famous for uh, wanting to show people his penis, and would often just pull it out and show it to him. Now, I, I don't know if he did that to Rue, but it wouldn't and surprise won't, me. It wouldn't really want to talk about it. And in the time, in the two times we've interviewed him on this podcast, he, you know, he just kind of smiled and politely declined to address the, the story. Well, it was a painful period for it's him. It's a very painful period. Because it's like, it was his Kathy Griffin, like how Kathy Griffin is going through right now with uh, the Donald Trump severed head. That's kind of what RuPaul went through. So so, so Milton Berle's on stage with RuPaul and starts being like, you know, when I was your age, I used to wear women's clothes too. And then RuPaul just turns to him and says, I love this comeback. And what do you do wear now? Diapers? <laughs> and he's like, oh, we're going off script now, huh? And that was like all the shot heard around the world. Mm -hmm. People were like, RuPaul is disrespectful to a comedy legend. How dare she? And I that wonder if that would go down differently if it were now. Well, the from I, you know, I, I think don't know. Somebody, well, I think, I think after Harvey Weinstein, you can't be one of those people that's showing your dick out in front of people. I would hope so. You know, so, you know, RuPaul was right all along and her, her career never fully recovered from that until Drag Race 
became the sensation. RuPaul did have a uh, television uh, talk show on VH1 for a couple of seasons uh, in 1997 and 1998, but at the time period, cable access around the country was dominated by drag queens and gender nonconforming people, and certainly RuPaul's uh, own origins also uh, can be widely seen in a lot of uh, cable access programming, and certainly, you know, uh, the, the two great Tom Rubnett's short films, uh, Strawberry Shortcut and Pickle Surprise, Pickle Surprise, inspired Cooking with Drag Queens, and um, and certainly like our paying tribute to to those great moments in cable access history. And my own experience as a drag queen on cable access in the early '90s um, led to where we all are today. You know, and and certainly you know. Well, Feast of Fun and RuPaul's Drag Race and a lot of these drag queens. And if I can leave everybody with something from here is that we're very much a community. We inspire and influence each other in, in very deep, meaningful ways and continue to do so as the years go by. When you guys have certainly done that with me, like, you know, like I, I think I mentioned this to you guys at Austin, but, you know, I've been listening for like nine years. And when I started, you know, like, I think I think I started writing the year before Drag Race season one, and um, there was like not very many places to find information about drag, and you'd just be kind of looking at like misunderstood Screaming Queens website and trying to Google girls from there, and then I finally found your show, and I was like, "Holy shit! I have hit the treasure trove," and I've been <laughs> listening ever since because nobody's you know there's not anybody else that's been like just documenting drag interviews. And you guys, like so many of these interviews, have helped me find out little details that have led me down paths that have led me to so many of the things that I've discovered. And I am eternally grateful for that. I, I really appreciate that. And, and you know, somebody else who's, who's part of our sort of uh, ecosystem is James Mansfield. Uh, if you guys get oh, a I chance love James. to see uh, James Mansfield, not her makeup tutorials, but her drag herstory videos on yes. YouTube, uh, they're really well produced and, mm -hmm. and actually... You know, it's a, it's a shame that James Mansfield's kind of known as as this early eliminated queen from her season in RuPaul's Drag Race because she has so much more to offer, and you can see her on our mm -hmm. episode of Cooking with Drag Queens, and and her own work mm -hmm. on YouTube is really mm -hmm. outstanding. But that's what we tell all the drag queens, and we've you know we've told some drag queens over the years is like you know who get on with these reality TV shows, and they don't always get the best uh, you know the best treatment, or they don't come off very well, or the public doesn't really like them. Like, don't let that show define you. Go out and do other things. Make yeah, YouTube. Videos, uh, come on podcasts pro, you, do your other work show the world what else you have you let one show define you you're a fool princess I, I, and part of it I think is you know when you spend a lot of energy and time uh, quarreling with people or, or with your own community or yourself even mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's robbing you out of the very little time we have in this world and energy to create your art and <sighs> You know, if I can inspire or, or send one message to our audience or the drag queens who may not who listen to this show and may not necessarily click with the guests or with us. And they're just kind of like searching for a pathway for themselves. Is there spending time on your art and learning about your own culture and history is never time wasted. And, Truth. And that is, you know, the reason that RuPaul is so successful and the reason we can do this podcast and, and you know, are seen as successful by some people um, is because we put a lot of time and energy into building our community and reaching out to people and most importantly, learning about who we are and where we come from. And, you know, certainly Courtney Act is somebody who I would say she's a very wise and intelligent drag queen. And part of it is because she values LGBT history and you know her one of her most iconic moments on her season from RuPaul's Drag Race was when she paid tribute to Klaus Nomi with that mm. angular tuxedo yes. look. I love that. I was like, yes. Go read my dissertation, people, please. <laughs> <laughs> is your dissertation <laughs> available as a book somewhere? It is available online at my website. Um, I'm going to put it in a more prominent place, but right now uh, it is at the only lady J. It's just the letter J at the end. Dot com. Um, and it's under my bio at the very bottom. There's a thing where it says the title of the dissertation and you just click right there and then go down to the bottom of the actual page where it is in the system for electronic theses and dissertations and just hit download. 
and it'll give you the whole 230 page thing covering Klaus Nomi, Joey Arias, the ballroom scene, Madonna, Jenny Livingston, David Bowie, um, all the drag movies of the 90s. That's probably the best chapter if you just want to read through something fun. Mm. And honestly, what I want to make sure everybody knows is this was never meant to be for academics. So the language is meant to be for anyone to read. Um, and the book that I'm working on is going to be hopefully in process in the next year. Uh, and that'll be like half this and half this dissertation and half like my history as a queer person coming out in the rural South and growing up in the middle of nowhere and finding these movies. Mm -hmm. And so you are a doctor of what? I am technically a doctor of musicology, okay, um, which is like music history, that sort of thing. I'm trained first as a pop and rock music historian. And so this, so this dissertation that you did about drag has a musical element because it uh, because it's about supermodel David Bowie. <laughs> David Bowie. Um, it's okay. it, there's analysis in a few different places. I look at musicology mm -hmm. more as. Music is an object around which culture is structured and around which people build their lives. And how do we look at it in that way? Um, how do we receive it? What do we do with it? What does it mean to us? Uh, what does it mean about a society and a place and a culture? Um, why is it produced the way it is? Um, so there's not a ton of analysis. I don't do like chordal analysis. I, I think that's kind of fruitless in talking about drag. Like we don't talk about our drag that way. So why would I just throw music theory at something? Um, so I try to talk about things the way that like a drag queen would talk about as far as movement and how things relate to the song. Um, but it's mostly just a history that is about how these people fit into uh, rock and pop music history mm. in ways that are really, really significant and that have been written out of most other histories. Awesome. And so you're working on a book about all this stuff um, that sort of uh – you know, drag history with personal history. Yes. That's my next big project is sort of, I've been doing a lot of like gigs where I do like, uh, ask a queer hillbilly. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like I'm like, I'm a Southern white trash, big, crazy family. Right. And I'm a, you know, unusual in being a rural Southern girl and being a genderqueer non-binary person. Um, so, my story is unusual in many ways, and my families are crazy on all sides, and I am crazy. So I think people will enjoy that part just as much as they will the history, if not more. Um, yeah, my family's completely fucking nuts, so prepare. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're from the backwoods of East Tennessee. Have you ever been to a ferry, the ferry commune around there in, in um, Murphy's Borough? Short Mountain? Liberty? Short Mountain is on my to-do list, but I have not been as of yet. Girl, I've been it's, a, it's a it's a part of living history right now. Uh, it may not be around. I'm surprised it's still around all these years later. But uh, definitely, if you, you know, if you don't feel comfortable sleeping in a tent, oh, I'm good. Bring a Winnebago <laughs> or something because it's it's hard to get off that mountain when the sun goes down. Yeah, you're you're I will stuck there. Say, you know, I'm going to Dollywood regularly. So I have lots to say about that. <laughs> Mm. Well, Lady J Martinez, Dr. Lady J, it's if you're nasty, uh, thank you so much for coming and talking to us a little bit of our drag history. I feel like we just kind of scratched the surface here. We, oh, yeah. We that, going you know, deeper. I want to talk again. I'm about it. But uh, thank you so much for having me today. And I had such a good time with y'all. And I hope we get to talk lots more about some drag history. For sure, for sure. And it was really, it was a pleasure meeting you in the flesh in Austin, Texas at the Austin International Drag Festival. Yes, you as well. Thank you. Yes, girl. Keep on. Remember, reading is fundamental. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Keep, know your history, girl. The dissertation is ready for download. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Honey, she didn't just read you. She wrote a whole dissertation. dissertation. I wrote a whole dissertation. She has a doctorate in dragology. I have a doctorate in reading. Mm. Prepare them. <laughs> Thanks, girl. All right, bye. Bye. Lady J. Martinez. O'Neill. O'Neill Davenport Gutierrez <laughs> del Arroyo. What? She no. lives in Cleveland, Ohio. She, uh, Jeremiah Lady J. Martinez mm -hmm. O'Neill Davenport. Mm -hmm. She lives in, of course, the wonderful city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. 
and she's working on a drag book. She actually te- teaches queer history classes mm. for queers of all ages and hosts and performs in the drag burlesque scene. Check her out on social media and visit her website, the only lady J with the letter J at the end dot com. And of course, we're going to put links up to her fabulous stuff on our website, feast of I think next time I drive home to see my family in Erie, Pennsylvania, I'm going to definitely have to stop into Cleveland and catch one of her shows. We live in such a magical time mm-hmm. and such an amazing opportunity in history to be able to not just have our local drag community, but the whole world mm-hmm. be your drag community yeah. and be able to interact and visit and travel to as much as we can, either through the Internet or physically to see drag in all shapes and flavors mm-hmm. of all ages and all mm-hmm. kinds mm-hmm. around the world at, at these conferences like DragCon or at these festivals like Austin International mm-hmm. Drag Festival. And what's amazing about Lady J too is like she, you know what we have a, a, a former guest on the show, a, a, a past guest, uh, Say Kevi, who did the whole. <laughs> <laughs> food horny where he uh, spilled a Slurpee on the, uh, the sidewalk and then ate it up. He and came, paying tribute yeah. to divine eating dog shit off the sidewalk. Right. Um, I guess, you know, Lady J brought him to Cleveland or brought them to Cleveland. I prefer, I believe that Kevy's preferred pronouns is they and them. Uh, and she just hopped on a train and she picked her up at like 530 in the morning in Cleveland, uh, gave her a couple bucks for the show and put her up at her house and uh, had a good performance. So, you know, if you're looking for a gig in Cleveland, hit up Lady J. She'll take anyone. <laughs> Anybody. I'm just kidding. I love Kevy. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a magical time in our history and we've been doing this podcast now uh, coming in January for 14 years. Wow. And yet we have three weeks mm-hmm. to save the internet. Mm. So Comcast, Verizon, and AT&T want to end net neutrality, uh, which is the ability for all information on the internet to be treated equally. So, uh, they, these corporations want to do it and have uh, lobbied aggressively to Republican parties so they can control what we see and do mm-hmm. online. First, they want to gut these rules and regulations, and then they pa- plan to pass bad legislation that allows extra fees, speed throttling, and censorship. Mm -hmm. These may be the last days that we can contact and communicate with you guys. Um, But it's not over yet. You have the power to make a change. Please go to battleforthenet.com and urge, I urge you to, to write to your congressperson to call them and to attend a protest near you. There's all this information at battleforthenet.com where you can organize and be politically active and save the internet for yourself and future generations to come. If you don't take action, honey, ain't going to be around mm-hmm. much longer, you know, and, and, and you're going to have yeah. to be uh, being, you know, the, the, the drag scene might change back to mm-hmm. a, a very different mm-hmm. world that we don't right. like. And you have to remember, too, it's like it, this uh, it can. This will screw you in so many different ways. So it might take you longer to download this podcast. You there, or you might go to YouTube and they're being like, "I'm sorry, you have to pay extra for your internet provider to be able to access YouTube. You might have to pay extra to order something on Amazon, or it's just it's about freedom of information that uh, only the people with big money are going to be able to push out messages. And we know what kind of messages the super wealthy push out. It's messages that are only going to help them. And so the little guy once again, is going to get screwed. And you don't want that to happen. We're able to do this podcast not because these large, heartless corporations fund this show, uh, because you guys mm-hmm. make it possible. Mm-hmm. Um, because of your memberships on feastofun.com slash plus, we're able to continue doing this podcast for 14 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, we rely on you and your support to make mm-hmm. it possible. So please go to feastofun.com slash plus and consider being a member today. Or uh, make a one-time donation, you know, put a little bit of uh, gold coins in our uh, hun- as a Hanukkah present mm-hmm. or a little uh, hot lump of coal. Because coal, you know, these days you need all the energy you can get <laughs> well, on, in our mm-hmm. stocking at mm-hmm. feastoffun.com slash donate. I thought it was great when we were talking with Lady J, too, and she was talking about how, uh, you know, queer people can just kind of do these fantastic things on the cheap. You know, and here we have this podcast, and it's relatively inexpensive to produce, but it still costs something. You know, we still have to pay for the lights. We still have to pay for the electricity. Uh, we have to take time off from work to a- be able to do this kind of stuff. But we are doing it. Uh, honey, the, the microphones break, the cable. We replace mm-hmm. XLR cables like every six months because so much 
talking happens on these mm-hmm. poor little microphones, and they're like, "Please, no more!" You know, they're they're pounded to death. If you know what I'm saying, mm. like they they get they got a lot of action. These microphones, and uh, they have to be repaired. They have to be replaced, um, and our hard drive space, and maintaining and operating our website, um, just even s- delivering the files themselves is is quite expensive. We we spend a lot of money to make the show available to you guys. Um, and we appreciate your support and we know we can rely on you guys into the future to make the show possible. We thank you so much for listening. We thank Lady J Martinez, Davenport O'Neill, you know, for being a listener and for also coming on the podcast and yeah. telling us all about, you know, her wonderful career and uh, her dissertation. Mark, if, if you were, uh, if somebody who's listening to the show right now has stars in their eyes as a passion in their heart and a message to send out there to the world and they want to come on Feast of Fun, how do they go about doing the that? The best way to do that is uh, mail us at mail at and uh, let us know like, hey, I want to come on the show uh, or, you know, guest idea, that kind of thing. And then just tell us what you want to talk about. Send us, uh, you know, what your idea is. Give us like five to ten questions that w- we might ask you and what the answers might be. Uh, basically, you know, write the show for us. Yeah. Make it easy for us to yeah. help you, and we can help don't, you. Don't make us guess. Be like, well, you should know what this is about. I don't know what it's about. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have already contacted you. You don't know who the great Delilah Bouvier Gutierrez mm-hmm. Couture is. Well, mm-hmm. you will, you know, rule the day. You, you know. we, we work really hard, and we have a lot of people. Are you okay? Yeah, I was gonna sneeze, <laughs> but then it went away. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah. you know, we 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 need your help. We we rely on your participation, and we love having new guests. But we can only, you know, we need to justify why you, the guest, is on the show for the audience, because mm. the audience is gonna be like, "Who the hell is this? Mm. Why? What are we talking about?" Uh, and, and it can't just be like, hey, girl, I'm doing a, a show on Tuesday. Come see me. It's going to be great. Right. You know, because would you stand on a stage and tell the audience that came to see that performance that you're doing another performance someplace else? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You wouldn't treat the audience that came to see that that way. Don't treat our audience in the same way. So prepare yourself. Plan ahead. Give us some amazing food for thought because it's feast for, for feast of fun yeah we need for a reason yeah. <laughs> we're starving i like that we need food for thought at feast of fun thank you guys <laughs> so much for listening i'm fausto fernos i'm mark fillion bye bye